We are doing a lesson today with third grade on heat, um, what produces heat, and how can we trap heat, what are insulators and conductors. So first we make a list of things that actually produce heat. Next I take a jacket, uh, usually two, one big puffy jacket and uh, another thinner jacket, and ask if this jacket is warm or which one is warmer. After we have looked at things that produce heat, we talk about how heat moves. And I have each student hold an ice cube in one hand while holding nothing in the other hand. Once every student has an ice cube, we talk about the fact that we can feel the heat moving from our hand into the ice cube. With some classes, we discuss that there is no such thing as cold. Heat is energy. Heat can be produced. But cold is an adjective describing the absence of heat. When I ask them for things that produce cold, and we talk about a refrigerator, then we think about what the back of the refrigerator feels like. And since the back of a refrigerator is warm, we can then discuss, that, and most of them know that, and we can discuss that the job of the refrigerator is to pull heat out of the air. Same with the back of an air conditioning unit. So after they have held the ice cube for a minute, they can see that they are adding heat to the ice cube because it begins to melt. And then I tell them to stop giving heat to the ice cube. Just don't give any heat away. Force themselves. Think really hard. And don't let any heat out of your hand into the ice cube. And they immediately realize that this can't be done. So then they put their ice cube down and put their two hands together. They then put their two hands together and they can feel that heat is moving from the hand that didn't have the ice cube, the warmer hand, into the hand that feels cooler. And once again we talk about how heat moves and cold doesn't. Next, I show them a styrofoam cooler, and we talk about why it is called a cooler. If heat moves and cold doesn't, then why is a cooler a cooler? Does it make things cold? Does it add cold? And after a few minutes of discussion with each other, then usually they can determine that it is trapping heat, and then eventually someone will realize it must be trapping heat out, because I asked them where the heat would come from. Uh, to warm up whatever is inside and sometimes we put ice cubes inside and we talk about where heat would come from to melt those ice cubes and they say the air and then we put the lid on and at that point they can usually determine that if the air can't get in the warm air then uh, the job of the cooler is to keep the heat out. Then we add another confusing element. We talk about the fact that coffee cups meant to keep things warm are made of styrofoam and so are coolers that are meant to keep things cold. And we discuss the movement of heat and they have to determine why you would use the same substance for two opposite effects, keeping something warm and keeping something cool, and why styrofoam would be a good choice for both. And this is when we introduce the word insulator. We discuss that an insulator traps heat. It can trap heat in, it can trap heat out. And uh, the way I get them to arrive at this word that they probably haven't heard before is to ask what they put in their house, in the attic and in the walls, so that they can keep heat in in the winter and keep heat out in the summer. And usually they can come up with the word insulation. And then it leads us to the word insulate. Next, we take four cups to determine the insulative properties of each. We have a steel can a paper cup with sort of a foam coating like you'd find at a coffee shop, a styrofoam cup, and a coffee mug. And they hypothesize which one will be the best at insulating, keeping the coffee warm. And I always play up the fact that a coffee cup is called a coffee cup for a reason. I have a really great hot water heater in my classroom. It only heats uh, two or three gallons. But when I need to, I can turn up the thermostat so that I can get really hot water. It's too hot for your kids to wash their hands in. Um, but it's really good for experiments where I need a difference between hot and cold, and I don't want to boil water. Uh, this won't get it all the way up to boiling, but we did get to, um, at its hottest, 64 degrees Celsius today. Um, I don't know what the manufacturer says, but that's what we arrived at was 64 Celsius. Um, when I turned it all the way up. That is a great temperature at which they're not going to burn themselves, but it's hot enough to really tell a difference. And we pour one cup of hot water into each of the four containers.
we made a chart on the board, and if I were doing this with older students, I would have them uh, actually time each one. Also with older students, I might give them the steel, ceramic, foam, and paper cups at each table, but I found with third grade that less is more. If I put steel, a steel container at one table, ceramic mug at another, foam at another, and the paper cup with the coating at another, um, they can see what I want them to see, but without getting caught up in timers and too many thermometers and too, many, too much data. Um, I also don't even time it a certain number of minutes. I just squeeze it in between other activities that we're doing. Um, but they can still see the trend. Uh, you can see that here are the steel and ceramic numbers. We all started at 64, and immediately the coffee cup begins to lose heat. Uh, the foam and paper coated with the foam coating both do pretty well. And we can talk about conductors and insulators. Uh, the last time on each one was uh, after my class had already left, so it was a good 15 minutes at least after we poured the water. Um, but there's enough difference within the first five minutes to tell which ones are good insulators and which are better conductors. Next, I give students a variety of materials in bags. Uh, this is bubble wrap. It's two quart size Ziploc bags, one down inside the other, and the layer in between, in this case is bubble wrap, no layer in between, just air, uh, some sort of cloth, this is felt, uh, cotton or uh, polyester, and aluminum foil. You could use different materials, but I want there to be an obvious difference in the thickness. Uh, students will choose two that they think will have different properties, uh, one being a good insulator and one not, and then they will put one on each hand and dip them into the ice water. They'll hold those there for about 15 seconds and see if they can tell that one is losing heat faster than the other. They're going to use that information in a little while to build something that will be... Okay, tell me. This one's colder because it didn't have as much thickness as this one. All right, so which is a better insulator? This one. The one that traps your heat. Good. All right. All right, which one's a better insulator, Jillian? This one. Huh? All right, so one of them is going to trap your heat better. Right, so the one that traps the heat is an insulator. We'll talk about the other one in a minute. Okay, which is a better insulator? Traps your heat. Wait, can you tell them? Once students have done the investigation with the mittens in the ice water, and we have talked about the coat, and we've done our experiment with the different containers and the properties of what they're made of, then they move on to the final step, which is creating... Uh, a bag that will best insulate ice cubes. So I take 10 ice cubes. The students will then in groups decide how they want to fill their insulating bag to keep the ice cubes from melting. Um, so they can choose different materials. Um, I've done it two ways where they choose a variety of materials all stuffed into one bag um, or where they pick just one material and each group does a different one so we can get different Data. I put the materials at the front, in the front of the room. Uh, I happen to have a big swimming pool that we use for different things. Um, and I put in there polyester left over from a cloud activity, bubble wrap, uh, towels that we use in class, bits of cloth, um, and some steel wool. Uh, and I throw that in to make sure that they have understood the concept that metal is generally a pretty good conductor. Um, and some packing peanuts. So there's our styrofoam again. Um, and they build their uh, insulating bag. They put their 10 ice cubes in a Ziploc down inside. Here are my ice cubes in the smaller bag that we are then going to put down inside the larger bag where they have put their insulating materials. Once again, if these were older students, we would actually weigh the ice um, to make sure that we were all starting with the same amount um, instead of just counting ice cubes. Uh, but for the third graders, um, 
I'm afraid that I will introduce the misconception that generally water is weighed. Um, and one thing we're trying to teach them in math is that we usually measure water by volume. Um, so I don't want to introduce weighing ice and then weighing the water when we're done um, because I don't want to undo what they've learned about volume. Um, so we just count them. And then when they're done, we measure the amount of water in the ice cubes. Uh, first, if I don't have much class time left, I'll put them on top of the heater um, or in the window in the sun. If we have plenty of time, then we'll just let them sit out on the counter. But um, To at least introduce controlling variables, we do all start with the same amount of ice, 10 cubes, and we put them all in our bags at the same time. We... Uh, heat them in a similar way, either all on the heater or all in the sun, um, so that we are beginning to talk about controlling variables. Um, and when we are done, if these were older students, I would pour the water into a graduated cylinder um, or weigh, weigh it again if we had weighed it to begin with, just the water to see how much um, had melted. But with third graders, we just hold it down in the corner of the Ziploc bag and see about how big a puddle of water we have. I mean, you can take the ice cubes out and, and look at just the water and then just sort of visually compare one bag to another. You can buy materials that are uh, superconductors and um, that you can put ice cubes on and they melt very quickly. Um, I just had the top of an old hot plate. Uh, the hot plate quit working and I pulled the top off. I think that was part of camp invention um, and found that it has those same properties. So we put an ice cube on the table and an ice cube on the old stove top. This is also a good way for me to get at their understanding of heat because some of them said, well, it used to be a stove top, so it's warm. And then we uh, that led us to a discussion of how long it could hold that heat since it hasn't been connected to the stove in about three years. Um, so, as you can see, this is a much better conductor than the tabletop. And it would usually melt a whole small ice cube. After a few minutes, the ice cube will not melt as quickly because um, most of the heat has been pulled from the outer edges uh, of the metal uh, surface and so it does not melt as quickly. Uh, it's harder for it to get heat from the air than it was to get it through that solid. And so sometimes I will have students put their fingertips at the edge. Um, this serves two purposes. For one thing it adds a better heat source to finish melting the ice cube if it hasn't already, but also they can feel heat leaving their fingertips. Um, and we talk about the fact that since the metal feels cold, it is not adding cold to their hand because cold is not a real thing. It is taking heat from their hand and they feel the sensation of cold.